These are the answers to the AP Chemistry packet that is entitled Unit 3, Summative Assessment Practice. On this slide, you can see Unit 3 at a glance. Unit 3 is entitled Intermolecular Forces and Properties. In this video, I will present practice problems that cover all of the topics in Unit 3. This video should help you to prepare for the Unit 3 Summative Assessment. In the video description area, there is a link to the AP Chemistry course and exam description, which we call the CED for short, and there is also a link to the packet that accompanies this video. Okay, let's get started. The instructions that you see on this slide are the same instructions that you will see on the AP Chemistry free response section. It says, show your work for each question in the space provided. Examples and equations may be included in your responses where appropriate. Four, calculations clearly show the method used and the steps involved in arriving at your answers. You must show your work to receive credit for your answer. Pay attention to significant figures. So as you can see, we are given a table with two different substances, ethanol and methyl acetate. We are given the chemical formula for each substance, the structural formula of each substance, the boiling point in kelvins for each substance, and we are given the vapor pressure at 293 Kelvin in TOR for ethanol, but not for methyl acetate. Number one, answer the following questions related to the substances shown in the table above. Part A, do you predict that the vapor pressure of methyl acetate at 293 Kelvin is less than 45 TOR or greater than 45 TOR? Justify your answer in terms of the data in the table above. Before I reveal the answer to part A, let me remind you of a comparison that I made in an earlier video when I was talking about topic 3.2. Here we have a sample of water at 20 degrees Celsius and a sample of ethanol that is also at 20 degrees Celsius. It is given that the vapor pressure of water at 20 degrees Celsius is 17.5 torr and the vapor pressure of Ethanol at 20 degrees Celsius is 44.6 torr. In the graph, we can see that there's vapor pressure on the y-axis versus temperature on the x-axis. The normal boiling point of a liquid is when the vapor pressure is equal to the standard atmospheric pressure of 760 torr. So for water, the normal boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. And for ethanol, the normal boiling point is 78 degrees Celsius. So there is an inverse relationship between the boiling point of a liquid, the normal boiling point, and the vapor pressure at a given temperature. So as you can see here comparing ethanol and water, the water has a lower vapor pressure at a given temperature and a higher boiling point, and then vice versa, the ethanol has a higher vapor pressure at that same temperature and a lower boiling point. So the answer to part A of question one is the following. Since we can see from the information in the data table that methyl acetate has a lower boiling point than ethanol, the vapor pressure of methyl acetate at a given temperature should be greater than that of ethanol. So the answer to part A is that the vapor pressure of methyl acetate at 293 Kelvin should be greater than 45 torr because the boiling point of methyl acetate is lower than that of ethanol. The substance that has the lower boiling point should have the higher vapor pressure. In part B, it says, identify all types of intermolecular forces present in each substance. Let's start with London dispersion forces because all molecules experience that. Then we'll take a look at the structural formula of ethanol and methyl acetate. And based on the asymmetry of each molecule, the bond dipoles in ethanol and the bond dipoles in methyl acetate will not cancel each other out. They're not symmetrically arranged in each molecule. So each molecule is polar and would also experience dipole-dipole forces. Now on to hydrogen bonding. In order for a molecule to behave as a hydrogen bond donor, there needs to be a hydrogen directly bonded to either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine in that molecule. Ethanol does have a hydrogen directly bonded to oxygen, whereas in methyl acetate, all of the hydrogen atoms are directly bonded to carbon. So ethanol can form hydrogen bonding attractions in a pure sample of ethanol, but a pure sample of methyl acetate does not experience hydrogen bonding. So the correct answer for part B is LDFs, dipole-dipole forces and hydrogen bonding for ethanol, and LDFs and dipole-dipole forces for 
methyl acetate. Moving on to part C, explain the difference in boiling point for these two substances in terms of the intermolecular forces identified in part B. We already know that ethanol has a higher boiling point than methyl acetate based on the data in the table. So there has to be stronger intermolecular attractive forces in ethanol to explain the higher boiling point. So the intermolecular forces present between molecules of ethanol, LDFs, dipole-dipole forces and hydrogen bonding, are stronger than the intermolecular forces present between molecules of methyl acetate, LDFs, and dipole-dipole forces. More energy is required to break up the intermolecular forces between molecules in ethanol, which explains why ethanol has the higher boiling point. In part D, it says draw a single dashed line in the diagram above to represent the strongest type of intermolecular attractive force experienced between two ethanol molecules. So we're talking about hydrogen bonding attractions between two molecules of ethanol. The reason why ethanol can behave as both a hydrogen bond donor and a hydrogen bond acceptor is that it contains a hydrogen atom that is directly bonded to oxygen and it contains an oxygen with a lone pair of electrons on it that's part of a polar bond. So our dashed line should show a connection between the lone pair on an oxygen in one molecule and the hydrogen that is directly bonded to oxygen in a second molecule. So here is one possibility of the dashed line that you could draw. And here is another possibility of the dashed line that you could draw. So either of these two answers would be correct for part D. In part E of this question, we are given the structural formula of one propanol, which is shown above. And on this slide, I'm gonna put the structural formula of ethanol right next to it so we can do a side-by-side -side comparison between these two molecules. It says, identify the specific type of intermolecular force that is most responsible for explaining why one propanol, which is shown on the right, has a higher boiling point than ethanol, which is shown on the left. Answer by drawing a circle around one of the choices below. That's either London dispersion forces or dipole-dipole forces or hydrogen bonding. Each of these molecules is classified as polar because of the asymmetry of the molecule in which the bond dipoles do not cancel out. Each of these molecules has a hydrogen directly attached to oxygen, so it can form hydrogen bonding attractions with neighboring molecules. But the molecule on the right, the one propanol, does have a slightly larger electron cloud than ethanol, which is shown on the left. Now, a larger electron cloud is associated with greater polarizability and therefore stronger London dispersion forces. So in part EI, we'll circle London dispersion forces, and in part E double I will justify our choice by talking about the size of the electron cloud. So this is what I said. The one propanol molecule has a larger electron cloud than the ethanol molecule. Therefore, one propanol is more polarizable and experiences stronger London dispersion forces than ethanol does. Number two, answer the following questions related to the substances shown in the table above. So in the table above, we have the magnesium 2 plus ion with a radius of 86 picometers, and we have the calcium 2 plus ion with a radius of 114 picometers. Part A, identify the type of interparticle attractive force that is formed between one of the substances in the table above and a sample of water molecules. So if you're talking about an attractive force between an ion and a polar molecule, that is known as an ion dipole force, the attractive force between an ion and a polar molecule. Part B, which substance, the magnesium two plus ion or the calcium two plus ion will experience stronger attractions to the nearby water molecules in aqueous solution? Justify your answer in terms of Coulomb's law. So with Coulomb's law, the attractive force between oppositely charged particles is directly proportional to the magnitude of the charge on the particles and inversely proportional to the distance between the charged particles. Since magnesium and calcium have the same magnitude of charge, then it must be about the distance. Now the magnesium two plus ion is actually smaller in size 
than the calcium 2 plus ion, and a smaller distance between charged particles would lead to a greater attractive force. So according to Coulomb's law, a smaller distance between oppositely charged particles results in a stronger attractive force. Magnesium 2 plus experiences stronger attractions to nearby water molecules than calcium 2 plus does because the magnesium 2 plus ion has a smaller ionic radius. Number three, each substance listed in the table above is classified as a different type of solid, for example, metallic, ionic, covalent network, and molecular. Based on the information in the table above, identify the type of solid for each substance. So what I'll do is I'll highlight specific information from topic 3.2, properties of solids. These are the essential knowledge statements from the AP Chemistry course and exam description, and this will help us identify specific details about each substance to classify the type of solid. So I'm starting with metallic solids, which are good conductors of electricity due to the presence of free valence electrons. Of the four substances listed in the table, substance two is the only one that is a conductor of electricity in the solid phase. Therefore, substance two should be classified as a metallic solid. Here I'm highlighting information about ionic solids. They conduct electricity only when the ions are mobile, as when the ionic solid is melted or dissolved in water or another solvent. So substance three is the only substance in the table that is not a conductor of electricity as a solid, but becomes a conductor of electricity when it's melted in the liquid phase. Therefore, substance three should be classified as an ionic solid. Now, that brings us down to substance one and four, and the only significant difference between them is the melting point. Let's take a look at which one we think is more likely to be covalent network, and which one is more likely to be molecular. Covalent network solids are bonded together with covalent bonds in this three-dimensional network, and so due to the strong covalent bonds, they tend to have high melting points. Molecular solids are composed of individual molecules, and the attractions are relatively weak intermolecular forces, so attractions between molecules. They tend to have, in general, a low melting point. So therefore, looking at the data in the table for melting point, substance one with its much higher melting point is more likely to be classified as covalent network, and substance four with its relatively low melting point would be likely a molecular solid. Question four says a balloon contains a pure sample of helium gas and has a volume of 10.0 liters, a temperature of 25.0 degrees Celsius, and a pressure of 755 torr. Part A, calculate the mass of helium gas present in the balloon. So for this problem, we're gonna use the ideal gas law because we are given a volume, temperature, and pressure. So we can use PV equals NRT, calculate the number of moles of helium, and then convert moles into grams. We'll convert the Celsius temperature into kelvins by adding 273. And then we'll use the ideal gas constant, R, that has a value of 62.36 because that has units of pressure in torr. So our pressure is 755 torr. Our volume is 10.0 liters. The temperature is 25.0 degrees Celsius. So we add 273, and that's 298 Kelvin. The ideal gas law is PV equals NRT. We're going to rearrange this equation to solve for the number of moles of helium. So N equals PV over RT. We'll plug in the values for pressure, volume, temperature, and the ideal gas constant. And when we do this math, we get the number of moles of helium, which is equal to 0.40628. I'm not gonna round off that number too much because this is not my final answer. So I'll convert this from moles to grams using information on the periodic table. So helium has a molar mass of 4.00 grams per mole. When I take the number of moles and multiply by the molar mass, I get 1.62512 grams of helium. I will round this off to three significant figures based on the measurements that I'm given. So I'll say 1.63 
grams of helium for part A. In part B of this question, it says the balloon rises to a higher altitude. The new conditions are a temperature of negative 50.0 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 0 0.475 atmospheres. Calculate the new volume of the balloon in units of liters. Assume that no helium gas escapes from the balloon. I'm going to show you two different methods to solve for the new volume of the balloon in part B. So the first method involves the ideal gas law. So we can use PV equals NRT to calculate the new volume. We can use the conversion factor to go from Celsius to Kelvin by adding 273. But now in part B, because they give us a pressure in units of atmospheres, we would use the ideal gas constant 0 0.08206 because that constant has units of atmospheres for pressure. So here's our pressure, 0 0.475 atmospheres. Our temperature, when we add 273, becomes 223 Kelvin. And the number of moles is the same as it was in part A because we can assume that no helium has escaped from the balloon. So we'll go ahead and write the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. Rearrange the equation to solve for volume. So V equals NRT over P. Plug in the values for moles, ideal gas constant, temperature, and pressure. And when we solve for the volume in liters, we get 15.653 liters. I will round this off to three significant figures based on the measurements that I was given. So I'll say 15.7 liters. So here is another method to do the calculation in part B and still get the same answer. I will write the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. And I'm going to divide both sides of this equation by the temperature, by T. So PV over T equals NR. Now I recognize that N, which is the number of moles of gas, is actually constant. So N times R would be a constant. P and V and T are changing. So I can set up an equation that looks like this. P1 V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2, where P1 and V1 and T1 are the initial values for pressure, volume, and temperature. And P2, V2, and T2 are the new values for pressure, volume, and temperature. Because the initial value for pressure is in TOR and the new value for pressure is in atmospheres, we will have to use the information on the equation sheet to convert either from atmospheres to TOR or tors to atmosphere, so the units of pressure are consistent on both sides of the equation. So in this problem, the initial pressure was 755 tor. I'm going to use the information on the equation sheet. One atmosphere equals 760 tor as a conversion factor. So 755 divided by 760 equals 0 0.9934 atmospheres. That's my P1. My V1 is 10.0 liters. My T1 is 298 Kelvin. My new pressure, my P2, is 0 0.475 atmospheres. My new temperature is 223 Kelvin. And I'm solving for V2, which is my new volume. So in this problem, I have 0.9934 times 10.0 divided by 298. I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by 223 and then divide both sides of the equation by 0 0.475. That way I can get V2 on a side by itself. And when I do this math, I get 15.7 liters. So another way of getting the same answer, just a different setup for solving that particular value in part B. In number five, it says data for two different samples of xenon gas are shown in the table above. Part A. Which sample, number one or number two, shows an observed pressure value that is different from the value predicted by the ideal gas law? Justify your answer with a calculation. So in sample one, it says the amount of gas in moles is 0 0.500. The volume of the gas in liters is 10.0. The temperature in Kelvin is 500. And the observed pressure in atmospheres is 2.05. So we'll use the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, rearrange this equation to calculate the pressure, so P equals NRT over V, 
plug in the values for sample one, and we'll use the ideal gas law constant that has units of atmospheres, so 0 0.08206. So there's my number of moles, 0 0.500. There's my ideal gas constant. Temperature is 500 Kelvin, and the volume is 10.0 liters. When I do this math, I get a value of 2.05 atmospheres. So for sample number one, the observed pressure value is actually the same as the value predicted by the ideal gas law. Let's move on to sample two. So for the data, I have a number of moles, the 10.0 moles, the same ideal gas constant that I used earlier because it has units of atmospheres, 500 Kelvin, and the volume is 1.0 liters. When I do this math, I calculate a pressure of 410 atmospheres, but the observed pressure value in the table is 418 atmospheres. So in sample two, the observed pressure is actually greater than the value predicted by the ideal gas law. So for part A of number five, the answer is sample two shows an observed pressure that is different from the value predicted by the ideal gas law. And again, I've justified my answer with a calculation. In part B, use particle level reasoning to explain why the gas sample you chose in part A has an observed pressure value that is a deviation from ideal behavior. This is topic 3.6. And with deviation from the ideal gas law, that can be caused by either interparticle attractions among the gas particles, or it can be caused from the volumes of the gas particles themselves. So you may recall in an earlier video, I said that when particles of gas experience attractive forces, then the observed pressure of the gas tends to be less than the value predicted by the ideal gas law. But in this example, the observed pressure value in sample two is actually greater, not less, than the value predicted by the ideal gas law. That means that interparticle attractions is not going to be the reason to explain what's going on. You may recall that the volume of the gas particles is assumed to be zero with ideal gas behavior. However, when the volume of the gas particles themselves becomes a significant fraction of the container volume, the free space in which the gas particles can move around is decreased. This causes the observed pressure of a real gas to be greater than the value predicted by the ideal gas law. So that's going to be our particle level explanation in part B. Under the conditions represented in sample two, the volume of the xenon particles represent a significant fraction of the container volume. This decreases the available free space inside the gas container, causing the observed pressure value to be greater than the value predicted by the ideal gas law. In question six, it says the particle diagrams shown above represent two sealed 1.0 liter vessels, each containing a pure sample of gas at the same temperature. The pressure of the neon gas in the vessel on the left is 1.74 atmospheres. Use the information in the particle diagrams, principles of kinetic molecular theory, and the relationships between variables in the ideal gas law to answer the following questions. Part A, calculate the pressure of argon gas in the sealed 1.0 liter vessel. So remember that pressure is directly proportional to number of moles. So if we double the number of moles, we will double the pressure. So there's a relationship between pressure and moles that is a direct relationship. If we count the particles in the diagram for neon, we get 12 particles of neon. When we count the particles for argon in the diagram, it's only four particles. So the ratio of particles of argon to particles of neon is four to 12 or one to three. Based on the relative number of gas particles shown in the diagram, the pressure in the argon vessel should be one third as much as the pressure in the neon vessel. And since the pressure of the neon gas in the vessel on the left is 1.74 atmospheres, that means that the pressure of argon would be one-third as much. So one-third times 1.74 
is equal to 0 0.58 atmospheres. So that's the answer to part A. If we move on to part B, it says indicate whether the average kinetic energy of the neon particles is less than, equal to, or greater than the average kinetic energy of the argon particles. Justify your answer. You may recall learning about kinetic molecular theory in topic 3.5 and it says the Kelvin temperature of a sample of matter is proportional to the average kinetic energy of the particles in the sample. So since in this example, each gas is at the same temperature, they're going to have the same average kinetic energy. So the two gas samples are at the same temperature, therefore the average kinetic energy of the neon particles is equal to the average kinetic energy of the argon particles. So as we move from part B to part C, it's a very similar style of question. We are making a comparison between the neon particles and the argon particles. But in part B, it was about the average kinetic energy. In part C, it's about the average speed. So part C says indicate whether the average speed of the neon particles is less than, equal to, or greater than the average speed of the argon particles. Justify your answer. So since we've already dis determined that the two gas samples are at the same temperature and they have the same average kinetic energy, then how can we compare their average speed? Well, in the information about kinetic molecular theory, it says that all particles in a sample of matter are in continuous random motion and the average kinetic energy of a particle is related to its average velocity by the equation kinetic energy equals one half mv squared, where m refers to the mass of the particle and v refers to the velocity or the speed of the particle. So there's an inverse relationship between the mass and the speed. Particles that are lighter and have a smaller mass will have a greater average speed, and then vice versa, particles that have a larger mass will have a smaller average speed. So we know that on the periodic table, neon weighs approximately 20 grams per mole, and argon weighs approximately 40 grams per mole. So the neon particles are lighter than the argon particles. Therefore, since neon particles are lighter, the average speed of the neon particles is greater than the average speed of the argon particles. They have the same kinetic energy the average kinetic energy in part B because they're at the same temperature, but the reason why neon is traveling faster is because it's lighter. Again, there's that inverse relationship between mass and speed. All right, let's take a look at part D of this question. The samples of neon and argon, again, these are in two separate one liter containers, are completely transferred from their original containers and combined together in a previously evacuated two liter vessel. Calculate the total pressure of the gas mixture in the two liter vessel. Assume that the temperature remains constant. So let's start with the pressure values that we know so far for these two separate containers. The pressure of the neon is 1.74 atmospheres because we were given that information in the question. For the pressure of the argon, we've already talked about that earlier in part A. So based on the information in the particle diagram, we know that there are four particles of argon and there are 12 particles of neon. Therefore, the pressure in the argon vessel is one third as much as the pressure in the neon. So that was in part A. We determined that the pressure of the argon was 0 0.58 atmospheres. So now you might be thinking that all we have to do to calculate the total pressure of the gas mixture is simply add 1.74 and 0 0.58 together. So let's take a look at the equation sheet for just a moment and we'll talk about whether that is the correct answer. So on the equation sheet, you do see what I'm highlighting here on this slide is that the total pressure of a gas mixture is equal to the sum of the individual partial pressures of the gases that are components of that mixture. The problem is the volume. So here on this slide, I've modified what it looks like on your packet. So I'm looking at neon one liter plus argon one liter. If they were combined together, if those two gases were combined together in a one liter vessel, then you could simply add 1.74 
plus 0.58, and the total pressure of the gas mixture would in fact be the sum of the individual partial pressures because the volume of the container would not be changing. The problem is it's actually a two liter vessel, it's not a one liter vessel. So to remind you about this, let me show you something I had mentioned earlier in a previous video about relationships between variables. So if I'm not changing the number of moles and I'm not changing the temperature, the pressure and the volume are inversely proportional. So in this video, watch what happens to the pressure when they go from the original volume to the new volume. Well, if you decrease the volume of the container by half, in other words, if now the volume is half as much as what it was before, the pressure is doubled. And if you go the other direction, if you double the volume, then the pressure is decreased to half its original value. So because of that inverse relationship between pressure and volume, that means that the final answer to part D is not 2.32 atmospheres, but rather half as much. So if I have a two liter vessel, then that means that I'm going from one liter to two liter, I'm doubling the volume, the pressure would be cut in half. So correct answer to letter D is 1.16 atmospheres. You do have to add the two partial pressures together, but then recognize that the final pressure would actually be half as much since the volume of the container is two liters and not one liter. All right, let's take a look at question seven. I know in question seven, there's a lot of information to process. And question seven also has multiple parts, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Let's go ahead and just take it one part at a time. So question seven says the following. Brass is a mixture containing copper and zinc. A student dissolves a brass sample in an excess amount of HNO3, which is known as nitric acid. This solution is then diluted with distilled water so that the final volume of the solution is equal to 100.0 milliliters. Assume that all of the atoms of copper and zinc in the brass sample are converted into the aqueous ions copper 2 plus and zinc 2 plus. Data from the experiment is shown in the table below. So the mass of the brass sample that was used in this experiment is 3.8 grams. And again, the final volume of solution that contains a mixture of copper 2 plus and zinc 2 plus ions is 100.0 milliliters. The student prepares a stock solution of 0 0.500 molar copper nitrate, CuNO3-2, by dissolving the solid copper 2 nitrate trihydrate in water. And I'll talk about that trihydrate word in just a moment. Information about the solid solute is shown below. So the name of this chemical is copper 2 nitrate trihydrate. The chemical formula is Cu, and then NO3 in parentheses, times 2, dot 3H2O. The molar mass of that substance, which includes the copper and the nitrate and the three waters, is 241.618 grams per mole. And the appearance of that substance is blue crystals. All right, part A, calculate the mass in grams of solid copper 2 nitrate trihydrate that is required to prepare 200.0 milliliters of 0. 0. 0.500 molar copper nitrate. Now, just to remind you, because we've talked about solutions and preparation of solutions and volumetric flasks in earlier videos, that there are two basic ways to prepare a solution. You can start with a stock solution, so you can have a solution that has a higher concentration and then perform a dilution. You can also start with the solid and then dissolve it in water. Now, back in the very first video from unit one, in one of the topics, which was topic 1.3, elemental composition of pure substances, that's when I introduced this idea of a substance known as a hydrate. So on this slide, which again I had presented back in the video for topic uh, 1.3, I talked about the fact that a hydrate is a substance that contains water as part of its formula. So when it says dot followed by a number and then H2O, that tells you how many moles of water there are for every one mole of that particular substance in the chemical formula. So 
when you do calculations involving hydrates, you typically have to add up not only the mass of the individual elements that are part of that formula, but you also have to add up the mass of the water, which is included as part of that chemical formula. So here's a close-up view of a substance that it says copper to nitrate, but then you can see the word trihydrate and dot 3H2O as part of that chemical formula. So I'm showing you on this slide where the 241.618 grams per mole, where that comes from. So Cu, copper, is 63.55, and we have one copper in this formula. Nitrogen is 14.01, and we have two nitrogen atoms in this formula. Now it says NO3, parentheses 2, so we have six oxygens that are part of those two nitrates, so 16 times 6 is 96, but then you'll see I have 18.016, that's the molar mass of water, times 3, because it says dot 3H2O. So there is where the molar mass of copper 2 nitrate trihydrate comes from. All right, so again, part A, calculate the mass in grams of solid copper 2 nitrate trihydrate that is required to prepare this solution. Now, 200.0 milliliters is going to get converted into liters because remember that capital M is molarity, that's moles per liter. So there are 1,000 milliliters in a liter. So 200 divided by 1,000 is 0 0.2, and I'm including the zeros because that's four significant figures. 0 0.2000 liters. Now I'm going to use the molarity. Molarity is moles per liter as a conversion factor, so I put liters on the bottom and moles on top. Then I have to remember that the trihydrate, it does contain Cu parentheses NO3 2. There's one mole of copper nitrate anhydrous for every one mole of copper nitrate trihydrate. I just did that to remind you that we are talking about a molar mass that does include the three waters. So the reason why I have to include that is because that's the form in which this substance is available. So there was no anhydrous copper nitrate available. It was copper nitrate trihydrate. So that 241.618 is the correct molar mass. Once this chemical is dissolved in water, then all of the excess water molecules just gets dispersed in the entire solution. But I do have to consider the form in which this substance appears. It does come in the form of a hydrate compound. I pick up my calculator and I go 0 0.2 times 0 0.5 times 241.618. So this is what I get on my calculator, 24.162 grams. And if I round that off to three significant figures, because my molarity has three significant figures, I get 24.2 grams. So that is my answer. 24.2 grams of copper 2 nitrate trihydrate. That is my answer to part A. So remember that there are two different methods of preparing an aqueous solution. One method is to take a solid solute and dissolve it in water. That's what you can see going on in part A. The other way of preparing an aqueous solution is to take a stock solution with a higher concentration and then perform a dilution. That's what's happening in part B. So above part B, it says the stock solution of 0 0.500 molar copper nitrate is used to prepare four different solutions with the following concentrations, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 0 0.4 moles per liter. The reason why they are making this series of solutions is going to be shown in part C, where they're going to create that graph of absorbance versus concentration. But in part B, we're going to do a calculation involving dilution. Calculate the volume of 0 0.500 molar copper nitrate that is required to prepare 50.0 milliliters of 0 0.400 molar copper nitrate. You may recall in an earlier video, it was for topic 3.7, talking about solutions and molarity, that you can perform a dilution and the calculations involved are what I would call the dilution equation M times V equals M times V, where the M stands for the molarity or the concentration of the solution, moles per liter, and the V represents the volume of that particular solution. So M times V for the concentrated solution equals M times V for the dilute solution. In part B, if we look at these four variables, we know the molarity of the concentrated solution, 
is 0 0.500 moles per liter. We know the molarity of the dilute solution that is being prepared in part B is 0 0.400 moles per liter. We know that the final volume of the dilute solution is 50.0 milliliters because that was given in the problem. What we don't know is how much in terms of volume of that stock solution is needed. So if we do this math, we have 0.4 times 50 and then divided by 0.5. And if we do this math, we get 40.0. So the answer to part B is that 40.0 milliliters of 0 0.500 molar copper nitrate is needed to prepare this particular solution. Now, let's take a look at part C. Again, there's that graph. They have done the spectrophotometer experiment with these different solutions, and the absorbance of each solution is measured with a spectrophotometer that was set to a wavelength of optimum absorbance for copper 2 plus ions. So we have absorbance on the y axis. And we have the concentration of copper 2 plus ions on the x-axis. So just to remind you, the appearance of aqueous copper 2 plus ions is blue. So on the y-axis, we have the absorbance. On the x-axis, we have the concentration of copper 2 plus ions. So as you increase the concentration, you get a deeper shade of blue, and that corresponds to a higher value for absorbance. So we have 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and 0 0.5. So those are all known concentrations of copper 2 plus ions. Now we come to the unknown that we have to analyze in this experiment. So the spectrophotometer is also used to measure the absorbance of the brass solution. So that is our unknown. And it contains a mixture of copper 2 plus ions and zinc 2 plus ions. Now if you're wondering, do I have to worry about the zinc? And the answer is no. You can assume that the zinc 2 plus ions have an absorbance of zero, so we can focus primarily on the absorbance, and that's coming from those blue copper ions in solution. So part C says the following. The absorbance of the brass solution is recorded as 0 0.75. So we can find that particular absorbance value on the y-axis in our graph. Use the graph on the previous page to estimate the concentration of copper 2 plus in the brass solution. Express your answer to two decimal places. So if I find 0.75 for the absorbance on the y-axis, and then I follow that to the line and trace it down to the x-axis, if I'm going to two decimal places, I would say that it looks like it falls somewhere between 0.35 and 0.40. I'm going to estimate that it's approximately 0.38 moles per liter. Most likely, I would accept answers that fall kind of somewhere in that range of around 0.37 to 0.39 moles per liter. But I'm going to use, as my answer to part C, I'm going to say 0.38 moles per liter, which I estimated from the graph. Now I'm going to focus on part D, which is going to take the answer to part C and then do something with it because that's concentration, that's moles per liter. Part D, calculate the number of moles of copper 2 plus ions that are present in the 100.0 milliliter sample of the brass solution. So the first thing I'm going to do is convert the volume, 100.0 milliliters, into units of liters. There are 1,000 milliliters in one liter, so therefore, when I go from milliliters to liters, I divide by 1,000. 100 divided by 1,000 is 0.1. I'm going to write that with four significant figures because that's how many sig figs the volume measurement has. So 0 0.1000 liters. Now I'm going to use the answer to part C, the concentration of copper ions in this brass solution, as a conversion factor. So liters on the bottom. Moles on top, 0 0.38 moles of copper 2 plus ions per liter. The math would be 0 0.1 times 0 0.38. And I would round off my answer to two significant figures because the molarity has two significant figures. So I get 0 0.038 moles of copper 2 plus ions. So that's my answer to part D. We're going to use that value in the next part. So on this slide, I'm reminding you about what was done in this experiment. Brass is a mixture of copper and zinc, 
That sample of brass has a mass of 3.8 grams. It was dissolved in nitric acid. It was diluted with water. And we assume that all of the atoms of copper and zinc that were in the brass sample are converted into copper 2 plus ions and zinc 2 plus ions. So as I transition from the answer to part D to the calculation in part E, I just wanted to remind you that moles of copper ions are the same as moles of copper atoms that were present in this brass sample. So 0 0.038 moles of copper is now going to be converted into grams using the information on the periodic table. So when you look up the atomic mass of copper or the molar mass of copper, it's 63.55 grams per mole. And then that number that I get on my calculator, 0 0.038 times 63.55, it's approximately 2.4 grams. So right now I'm showing you the unrounded answer, 2.4149 grams of copper. Mass of copper divided by mass of brass sample times 100. So that's what I'm doing. Mass of copper divided by mass of brass sample times 100 to get the mass percent of copper in this sample of brass. Now, if I use the unrounded answer, 2.4149 divided by 3.8 times 100, I get 64% copper by mass. If I use a rounded answer of just 2.4, I get 63% copper by mass. So looking at your answer to part E, it's going to be either 63% or 64% copper by mass, depending on how you rounded it. All right, there's one more part of this question. This is part F, and this has to do with the so-called ion dipole forces between the ion of copper and the water molecules. Remember that a water molecule does have a dipole in which the hydrogen atoms are the partial positive charge and the oxygen atom is the partial negative charge based on the difference in electronegativity between hydrogen and oxygen. So we're going to point the negative end of the water molecule toward the positive copper ion. So this is how I would arrange those three water molecules in the proper orientation to show that the negative end of the water molecules is pointing or attracted toward that positive copper ion. All right, well, that is the correct answer to part F. Now let's move on to question eight. In question eight, we are given two particle diagrams, and these particle diagrams represent solutions of ionic compounds. We have sodium chloride on the left, and we have magnesium chloride on the right. So the diagram on the left represents 1.0 liters of 1.0 molar aqueous sodium chloride. The diagram on the right represents 3.0 liters of aqueous magnesium chloride, but we don't know what that concentration is yet. The water molecules are not shown. So the black circles in the diagram are the positive ions, cations, and the white circles in the diagram are the negative ions or the anions. Use the information in these particle diagrams to answer the following questions. Part A, determine the concentration in moles per liter of magnesium chloride in the 3.0 liter container represented by the diagram on the right. So the first thing I'm going to do is process the information that's given to me in each diagram. In the diagram on the left, I can see four black circles and four white circles. That represents four sodium ions and four chloride ions. In the diagram on the right, I see six magnesium ions and 12 chloride ions. The next thing I'm going to do is focus on what I know about volume and concentration. Since the sodium chloride information, it says one liter of a one molar solution, that tells me that there should be one mole of sodium chloride in that solution. So one mole of sodium chloride, that would contain one mole of sodium ions. Now let me look at the change from the left to the right. I go from four sodium ions to six magnesium ions. When you go from four to six, that's an increase by a factor of 1.5. So if I know that the solution on the left contains one mole of sodium, and I'm changing by a factor of 1.5, then that means that the solution on the right contains 1.5 moles of magnesium ions. 
I have to be careful that there is also a consideration of the volume, not just the moles, but the volume as well. So let's process this. In the solution on the right, that's 1.5 moles of magnesium. Therefore, 1.5 moles of magnesium chloride is present, but it's dissolved in a total volume of 3 liters of solution. So the molarity is moles divided by liters. 1.5 moles of magnesium chloride, based on the comparison of the particles, 3 liters of solution. So 1.5 divided by 3 is 0 0.5. So the answer to part A is 0 0.5 moles per liter, or you could use capital M as your abbreviation. So in part A, we were given a particle diagram. We had to interpret that particle diagram and come up with the concentration of the solution. In part B, it's kind of the other way around. We are told to draw a particle diagram that will represent one liter of 1.5 molar sodium chloride. So now we have to come up with the particle diagram on our own. Let's do a side-by-side -side comparison since we were already given what the particle diagram should look like for one liter of one molar sodium chloride. All we have to do is change the concentration from one molar to 1.5 molar. We're not changing the volume. We're going from one to 1.5. That's an increase by a factor of 1.5. If I have four black circles and four white circles representing the sodium and the chloride respectively, all I have to do is multiply four times 1.5. So there should be, in this particle diagram on the right there, there should be six sodium ions and six chloride ions because four times 1.5 is six. So representing six black circles and six white circles, that would be the answer to part B. All right, let's take a look at question nine. Question nine is a chromatography question. We are given the following information. A paper chromatography experiment is performed to investigate the properties of two different pure dyes labeled as X and Y. The student places a drop of each dye at the indicated position on the chromatography paper, a polar material, as shown above on the left. The paper is placed in a nonpolar solvent which travels up the paper. The results of the experiment are shown above on the right. So we can see in the diagram above that X is traveling farther up the paper than Y. We know it is a nonpolar solvent, and now we have to make a conclusion in part A which dye, X or Y, represents the more polar substance. Justify your answer in terms of the interactions between the dye and the mobile phase in this experiment. So our answer cannot focus on the stationary phase, which is the paper itself. Our answer needs to focus on the mobile phase, which is the solvent that's traveling up the paper. Now, X did travel farther than Y, but that means that X mixes better with, or is more soluble in, the nonpolar solvent. X is more likely to be nonpolar because it seems to be mixing better with the nonpolar solvent. Remember that nonpolar substances tend to be more soluble or more attracted to nonpolar solvents. So we have to talk about Y as being more polar than X because it did not travel as far up the paper. So here's what I said Y is the more polar substance. Y did not travel as far up the paper as X did. So therefore, Y actually has weaker attractions to the nonpolar mobile phase compared to X. So Y is more polar than X because it did not travel as far up the paper, therefore did not mix as well with the nonpolar solvent. As I move on from part A to part B, it's the same mixture, it's the same solvent, but now we go from paper chromatography to column chromatography. A second chromatography experiment is performed in which a mixture of X and Y is carefully added to the top of a chromatography column filled with the same nonpolar solvent used in the paper chromatography experiment. Separation of the mixture occurs as the dyes, X and Y, travel at different rates through the column. Two distinct bands are observed as shown in the diagram on the right. So in part B, 
based on the results of the paper chromatography experiment described above, identify each component of the mixture by writing the letter X or Y in each box provided in the diagram below. So to remember that chromatography involves traveling up the paper or down the column, we should focus on the difference between X and Y. X moved a greater distance up the paper, as we've already seen. This column uses the same nonpolar solvent. X is going to move more quickly through this chromatography column. That's what we're expecting. X is going to move more quickly because it traveled farther up the paper in the paper experiment. So if X is moving more quickly through this column, that would put X here, so lower down the column, and that would put Y here. So the correct answer to part B is that X is moving more quickly through the column and would be labeled like that. All right, our next question in this summative assessment practice is number 10. So number 10 says infrared spectroscopy is a useful tool for scientists who want to investigate the structure of certain molecules. Which of the following types of transitions is most likely to occur as the result of a molecule absorbing a photon of infrared radiation. And our choices are a transition in molecular rotational levels, a transition in molecular vibrational levels, or a transition in electronic energy levels. So the mnemonic devices that I taught you to help you remember how each form of radiation affects a sample are the following. When you think of microwave, think of the glass dish that's rotating, so microwave, is associated with rotation. For infrared, I said think of your phone on vibrate, so the phone is vibrating and you say it's ringing, so IR represents vibration in the molecule. And then I said that visible and UV, you think of looking up at the sun and you think of electrons jumping up to higher levels. So the correct answer here is infrared is associated with the vibration of the bonds and the molecule, so therefore the answer to number 10 is vibrational levels. All right, let's take a look at question 11. In question 11, it says that the bromine-bromine bond has a bond energy of 193 kilojoules per mole. Part A, calculate the minimum amount of energy in joules that is required to break the BR-BR bond in a bromine molecule. So I'm given 193 kilojoules per mole. What I need to do is set up conversion factors so I can change 193 kilojoules per mole into joules per molecule. I want to know how much energy in joules is required to break the BR-BR bond in one molecule. Now, since one mole is already on the bottom, I'm going to put one mole on the top and use Avogadro's number, which is the number of molecules in one mole, in my first conversion factor. So if I did this conversion, if I multiply by one mole of Br2 over Avogadro's number of Br2 molecules, then my answer would be in units of kilojoules per molecule. To go from kilojoules to joules, I have to use the number 1,000. So there are 1,000 joules in one kilojoule. Now I can get the kilojoules to cancel out, and my answer would be in joules per molecule. When I pick up my calculator, I'm going to do 193 divided by Avogadro's number times 1,000. And if I do that math, I get 3.20 times 10 to the negative 19. That is the number of joules required to break the bond in a single Br2 molecule. As I move on to part B, I'm going to use that value because it says calculate the longest wavelength of light in meters that can supply enough energy per photon to break the BR-BR bond in a BR2 molecule. So that number, 3.20 times 10 to the negative 19 joules, I'm going to use that in part B. Let's take a look at the equations on the equation sheet. So there's Planck's constant, there's the speed of light, and the energy is my answer to part A. So I'm going to rearrange the equations. E equals Planck's constant times frequency, C, the speed of light, equals wavelength times frequency. I will combine them together into one equation. So energy equals Planck's constant times the speed of light 
divided by the wavelength. If I rearrange that equation, that combination equation, and solve for wavelength, I get wavelength equals Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by my answer to part A, which was 3.20 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. When I do this math, the joules will cancel out, the seconds will cancel out, and my answer will be in units of meters, which is what I want. So this math gives me 6.21 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. Now, as I move on from my answer to part A, which is 3.20 times 10 to the negative 19 joules, my answer to part B, which is 6.21 times 10 to the negative 7, when I go on to part C, let's see if we can take a look at these answers, and that might be part of our calculation. So here is what it says in part C. Does a photon with a frequency of 4.00 times 10 to the 14th inverse seconds, or hertz, have enough energy to break the BR-BR bond? Support your answer with a calculation. Now, there are at least three different ways you can answer part C and justify your answer with a calculation. So I'm going to show you three different ways to solve part C of this question. So let's do some math with this frequency value that we're given. 4.00 times 10 to the 14th hertz. According to the equation sheet, speed of light equals wavelength times frequency. So when I use the speed of light and the frequency I'm given in part C, I can calculate the wavelength in meters. And so when I plug in the information into that equation and I do speed of light divided by frequency, I get a wavelength of 7.50 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. So here's one way of justifying my answer, because I've just done a calculation for wavelength. I can say that the wavelength of this photon is longer than the wavelength calculated in part B. The longer the wavelength, the lower the energy. Therefore, a photon with a frequency of 4.00 times 10 to the 14th hertz should have less energy than what is required to break the BRBR -BR bond. So this photon, no, does not have enough energy to break the BRBR -BR bond because the wavelength is longer than the answer we got in part B, therefore the energy would be lower. All right, here is a second way you could have done this calculation and gotten the correct answer with a justification. So remember that 4.00 times 10 to the 14th hertz, or inverse seconds, is what we're given. If I use this particular equation, which relates energy and frequency, and uses Planck's constant, I could calculate the energy associated with this particular frequency. So here is my calculation. Planck's constant times the frequency I'm given in part C. I do this math, and I get a value of 2.65 times 10 to the negative 19 joules per photon, or you could also say per molecule. This would be the amount of energy associated with the frequency given in part C. Let's compare it to the answer that was already calculated in part A. So in part A, the minimum amount of energy in joules was 3.20 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. And what I just got using the frequency in part C is a value of 2.65 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. So I could also say, no, there is not enough energy to break the bond because the energy of this photon, 2.65 times 10 to the negative 19 joules, is less than the energy value that was calculated in part A. So therefore, a photon with a frequency of 4.00 times 10 to the 14th hertz does not have enough energy to break the BRBR -BR bond. And now I will show you one more calculation that you could have done, which would also have gotten you to the same conclusion. So if we take this particular energy, 2.65 times 10 to the negative 19 joules, and we change it from joules per photon into kilojoules per mole. So again, using Avogadro's number, the number of particles in one mole, the number of photons in one mole, and then there are a thousand kilo, sorry, a thousand joules in one kilojoule. If I do this calculation, I end up with a value of 160 kilojoules per mole, which again was connected to the frequency value that I was given in part C. So how does 160 kilojoules per mole 
compare with 193 kilojoules per mole? Well, it's not enough. So the energy of this photon is 160 kilojoules per mole, which is less than the value I was given of 193 kilojoules per mole. And that's what's required to break the BRBR bond. So again, this is a third calculation that would show you that a photon with this particular frequency of 4.00 times 10 to the 14th hertz, no, does not have enough energy to break the BRBR bond. So again, three different ways of doing the calculations. One of them was a wavelength calculation. So the wavelength was longer than the answer in part B. So it has less energy and does not have enough energy to break the bond. There's the number of joules per photon or per molecule that was less than the value that was needed in part A, the energy value in part A, and then converting it to kilojoules per mole, 160 kilojoules per mole is less than 193 kilojoules per mole. So no, this does not have enough energy to break the bond. All right, well, this is the end of the video because this was the last part of the last question. I hope that you found these answers and explanations helpful. Thanks for watching and good luck studying for your Unit 3 Summative Assessment.